entire world's about to forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Including me. Everyone can't stop people still know. That's not how the spell works, and it's very difficult and dangerous to change it mid casting. So why exactly didn't you just ask Doctor Strange to erase Mysterio from everybody's memory? The problem is not Mysterio. Welcome back to the channel everyone, it's your pal Noms here, and I'm back talking about the latest dumpster fire to hit the rotting core of the ever-declining and creatively bankrupt Marvel Cinematic Universe, and this movie went in balls deep to prove the latter on this one. Hello, Peter. Spider-Man No Way Home is without a doubt the most anticipated and hyped movie of 2021. It's also one of the messiest and poorly constructed movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe to date. However, it's also, for a number of different reasons, a very enjoyable film that will likely be beloved by the majority of audience members. Though, however, on the flip side, I've heard some disgruntled fans refer to this movie as the last Jedi of Spider-Man films. But actually, and this may just surprise some of you, I highly disagree with that notion. The last Jedi was a writing nightmare, but it was also actively trying to spit in the face of its audience. Spider-Man No Way Home, on the other hand, I'd say is far more akin to The Force Awakens, a movie shrouded in secrecy right up until its release, baiting hype and anticipation from encouraging endless fucking fan theories from its audience due to how it was marketed, while using nostalgia and only nostalgia as its key selling point, by digging up relics of the past, characters made by other creators, and inserting them into this corporate product to sell tickets, with caution thrown to the wind regarding its writing quality so long as the marketing boxes are ticked. The Last Jedi was anti-fan service. Spider-Man No Way Home, much like The Force Awakens, ejaculates fan service all over the goddamn screen, like it just got off a 14 year dry spell. And unfortunately, the writing, at least for the most part, is a complete train wreck. That said, there's only a handful of things I actually did enjoy about this movie, but the parts that were good, while few and far between, admittedly, were pretty damn good. So I don't fault anyone for walking out of this movie having had a great time. It was corporately catered to give you that experience. But that said, this movie really isn't anything to celebrate as some masterpiece or whatever. Not even close. And I don't think it should come as any surprise, given how the MCU has been rapidly declining in quality in recent years, as well as Tom Holland even publicly admitting that the Spider-Man No Way Home script was rewritten on an almost daily basis because he'd come into work and the people in charge couldn't make sense of their own plot. Now Tom Holland didn't say that in as many words, but based on what he did say, I gotta infer that Marvel had almost no fucking clue what they were doing with this one. Just get the nostalgia on screen guys, I don't give a fuck how, just get it done is likely what Kevin Feige continuously shouted from the sidelines. Okay, dickhead, John Watts likely shouted back. It's like a bison's penis, what is that and that's left us with the finished product that is Spider-Man No Way Home. But enough with the introduction, let's get started, shall we? The beginning of the movie, I honestly don't have many complaints about at all, really. It picks up exactly where Spider-Man Far From Home left off, which is good. It didn't take the easy way out by doing a time skip and leaving us to wonder what happened. After Mysterio frames and outs Peter Parker's identity as Spider-Man to the entire world. With the help of J.K. Simmons' J. Jonah Jameson, the first of many fictional assets poached from other filmmakers. Anyway, what happens is exactly what we would expect. All fucking hell breaks loose. Peter's life is completely changed from this day forth. Not only is his private life all but completely destroyed, but a sizable portion of the general public thinks he's guilty. This leads to public divide and protests calling for his arrest. His family and friends are subject to interrogation by police. He has to relocate. And his hopes for a college future have all been washed down the drain. Not a single college would accept him, despite Peter being one of the smartest graduates from his high school. He's also apparently smart enough to rebuild inhibitor chips and cure electro and Sandman's elemental plagues, but we will get to that. But unfortunately, anyone associated with Peter is also paying the price, including his best friend and girlfriend, who were both denied entry to college as well, because they were subject to interrogation as being potential accomplices 
in Mysterio's death. Thankfully, Peter is freed from all charges thanks to a mostly unsurprising but very welcome cameo from Matt fucking Murdoch, the very same from the Netflix Daredevil series played by Charlie Cox. He was certainly cheered in my cinema, and I'd say he was actually utilized quite well as a cameo. And as a side note, this is actually how Peter Parker, more or less, meets Matt Murdock in Spider-Man the 90s animated series. Peter is framed for something completely different, mind you, but Matt Murdock shows up to clear Peter's name. So this cameo was not only well handled, but also quite faithful as well. How did you just do that? I'm a really good lawyer. However, despite the criminal charges being dropped against Peter, he and his friends are left squarely up shit creek, with their public standing as human beings as well as their academic futures being completely destroyed. Well, at least we think their academic futures are destroyed, because you see, Peter hasn't actually tried talking to the administrators of MIT yet. He instead opts to go to Doctor Strange's house, hoping for some kind of miracle spell that can brainwash the entire world. And it's here we start to run into a cavalcade of problems. But I want it to be crystal clear that right up until this point, I thought the film did an excellent job at showing the impact and aftermath of Spider-Man Far From Home on Peter's life and the lives of his loved ones. And it did a really good job at setting the stage for the plot. It's just unfortunate that the plot itself is contrived and nonsensical as fuck. I think we're just getting started. So Peter enters Sanctum Santora and speaks with Doctor Strange. There's some admittedly good MCU humor on display, with Strange explaining that Wong was made the Sorcerer Supreme after the events of Infinity War where Doctor Strange was blipped out of existence for five years. Wait, I thought you were the Sorcerer Supreme. No, he got it on a technicality because I blipped for five years. Oh. Anyway, Peter explains his problem to Doctor Strange, and initially he's hoping that Doctor Strange can turn back time so that Peter can fix the problem, but Doctor Strange is immediately against the idea of meddling with space-time and says, even if you wanted to do it, the time stone is gone. However, just as predicted from the trailers, Doctor Strange proposes another option, something about magic runes of the almighty plot contrivance. Wong tells him it's too dangerous to use the magic runes, but Strange counters him by saying they use these runes to cast spells safely in the past to solve far less important problems, which yielded zero consequences. So it's Wong who is the voice of reason here and who is against the idea, but Doctor Strange is just like, Fuck it. And he goes ahead and does it anyway. Now the movie seems to think this justifies Doctor Strange throwing caution to the wind and casting this potentially dangerous spell by saying using the runes is commonplace for him. But as we all know, Doctor Strange isn't supposed to be an idiot. He isn't one to treat the concept of space-time as a joke. And if he was to use the runes to cast the spell, he would take every precaution imaginable to make sure the spell went correctly. But Doctor Strange does none of these things because the writers need plot to happen and the writers turn him into an idiot who just forgets that space and time is not something the former Sorcerer Supreme should be fucking with for the trivial matter of a teenager's identity crisis. If Doctor Strange took the time to make some preparations to ensure the spell wouldn't go wrong, I'd be fine with this. Or if some outside interference messed up the spell that was out of Doctor Strange's control, I'd be fine with that too. But no, the spell goes completely out of control, and it's all due to Doctor Strange's incompetence because he rushed into doing the spell before discussing the repercussions and the consequences of casting it with Peter. Seriously, this whole movie's plot could have been avoided if the two characters just had a 10 minute chat about the spell with one another. But Peter finding out that Ned, Michelle and Aunt May won't remember that he is Spider-Man during the casting of the spell opts for him to urge Doctor Strange to change the spell six times while he is casting it. Did it work? No. You changed my spell six times. Five times. You changed my spell. You don't do that. I told you. And that is why. Because Doctor Strange didn't take the time to talk to Peter before casting this incredibly dangerous spell. Oh my god, Ned. Okay, let's not change the parameters of this spell anymore while I'm casting Okay, I'm done, I'm done. I I swear I'm done. As predicted, this buttfuck of a movie's Spider-Verse multiverse plot is caused by Doctor Strange being an incompetent buffoon and Peter Parker being an indecisive selfish twat. Because after Doctor Strange locks down the spell and contains it from ripping apart space-time, at least temporarily, he finds out that Peter Parker didn't even try to solve his problems by himself, by just talking 
talking to the college administrators that rejected his application, causing Doctor Strange to get so mad as to kick Peter out of the sanctum. When you say convince them, you mean like I could have called them? Yeah, I could do that. You haven't called them? Well, I mean, I got their letter and I assume that that was- I'm sorry. Are you telling me that you didn't even think to plead your case with them first before you asked me to brainwash the entire world? Wow! What do you know? Yeah, no fucking shit, Sherlock. Maybe you should have asked him that in the first place. I mean, when you put it like that, then... And that's something else that bugs me about the way this movie's plot starts off, is that Peter didn't even try to solve this problem by himself. He instead opts to take the easy way out by scurrying off to Doctor Strange in the hope for some magical cure. I also wanted to point out that in the videos I made in the lead up to this movie's release, I said this would happen and it did in fact happen just as dumb as I predicted and only slightly less dumb as it was portrayed in the trailers. But oh boy, Marvel stands were really quick to leap to the movie's aid by saying that this was the evil Doctor Strange and not the real one which would explain this level of incompetence. And if you've seen Spider-Man Man No Way Home as well as a 10 credit scene, you know that that was incorrect. Also, it was speculated that the events of Loki were the reason for the multiverse opening up, and those events transpired at the same time as Spider-Man No Way Home, meaning Doctor Strange only thought he was responsible for opening the multiverse with his spell. I have not seen Loki, I really don't plan to, but that theory is a total bust, because it wasn't Loki, this contrived multiverse buttfuck of a plot is entirely the fault of a dumbed down Doctor Strange, which is a damn shame. Anyway, skipping ahead, Peter tracks down the MIT administrator in the middle of freeway traffic. As he's pleading his case, unsurprisingly to anyone who saw the trailers, the freeway is absolutely destroyed, and tentacles rise out of the ground, and we get reintroduced to Sam Raimi's OG Dr. Octopus, played by Alfred fucking Molina himself. I'll take care of the music. Dr. Octopus at first doesn't realize that Tom Holland is not his Peter Parker. He also asks Peter what he did to his machine, which is kind of confusing at first, but we later find out that Dr. Octopus teleported while he was choking Peter with his tentacle wrapped around his throat during the climax of Spider-Man 2. Well, I sure as hell hope he told Peter how to stop the machine before he teleported, because otherwise, that city is fucked. Tell me how to stop it. Doc Ock's rampage leads to an awesomely shot fight between him and Peter Parker's Iron Spider suit, and this was undoubtedly one of the best action scenes of the movie. Despite the fact that Peter loses this fight, even though he should have been able to end the fight with a simple taser web... Uh, taser web! Uh, uh, the fight itself was still an excellent piece of eye candy. Admittedly, part of the reason why Peter loses this fight is because he's trying to save the MIT administrator who was in peril for the duration of the fight. Which, in a way, is kind of a callback to the fight above the bank robbery in Spider-Man 2, when Spider-Man and Doc Ock are fighting on the side of a building while Aunt May is in peril. I don't know if it was intended to be a callback or not, that's just what I took from it. Though come to think of it, this sequence does more closely resemble Spider-Man's first encounter with Lizard, on the bridge from Mark Webb's first Amazing Spider-Man movie. Now the part that really pisses me off about this is when Doc Ock corners Peter Parker, almost impaling him with his tentacle blade, and Dr. Octopus realizes something isn't right. This is not the Peter Parker he knows, but then somehow his tentacles, and I'm not entirely sure how to describe this, his tentacles absorb the nanotechnology from Peter Parker's Iron Spider suit. And then somehow, accidentally, Peter Parker is able to hijack Dr. Octopus's tentacles and start puppeteering him the fuck around. Okay, let me outline what the MCU's bread and butter is when it comes to humor. The MCU loves to make fun of the absurdity of superheroisms and use the weaknesses of each superhero to make light of their characters. Whether it's Spider-Man's inability to web swing with the absence of tall buildings, <laughs> the inability to lift Thor's hammer in Age of Ultron, oh, please be my guest. Are you even pulling? Are you on my team? Just represent, pull. All right, let's go. But if you put the hammer in an elevator... It would still go up. Elevator's not worthy. I'm gonna miss these little talks of ours. Huh? Or Loki's scepter being ineffectual against Tony Stark because he's lucky enough to have a piece of metal in his chest. Mm. 
This usually works. Well, performance issues, you know, it's not uncommon. One out of five. I because here's the thing, superheroes are absurd. It's a no fucking brainer. Marvel Studios love pointing it out to you. It's not exactly the most intelligent humor out there, but it will elicit a chuckle out of most of their audience. But the way the writers at Marvel Studios often use it come at inappropriate times and in inappropriate ways, and this is one of them. Sam Raimi's Dr. Octopus is one of the most beloved characters and villains in the superhero genre of movies, and has been shown in both Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, and in this very movie as a force to be reckoned with. But now that his tentacles have been neutralized, they essentially turn him into a gigantic joke because now he's harmless. And rather than being the sinister imposing threat that he's meant to be, he is now completely helpless, standing around like a buffoon, looking like a clueless idiot. And this persists for much of the movie, unfortunately. They essentially neuter Dr. Octopus, and since this is a Disney and present-day Marvel Studios production, it feels like a petty and narcissistic jab at this beloved character that belongs to those far more beloved movies than anything Disney has produced that pertains to Spider-Man. Listen, dipshits, don't hate, just make better villains, and there will be nothing to be petty about. Your lack of talent is quite evident by the fact that this entire movie is carried by other people's creations. And speaking of which, before Doc Ock or Peter can figure out what's going on, a pumpkin bomb falls from the sky, blows up several cars on the freeway, and a sinister and familiar laugh can be heard in the distance. And who should emerge but none other than Sam Raimi's OG Green Goblin himself, played by Willem fucking Dafoe. I'll take care of the music. Let me just say that Goblin's suit looks so fucking good. It's a damn shame this is the only time we'll see him wear the damn thing. Yeah, the trailer shot? That's all we get. Norman Osborn destroys the damn thing when he has another crisis of conscience in an alleyway somewhere where he destroys the Goblin mask before seeking out Peter Parker later on. But back on the freeway, we get another problem. Dr. Octopus, Otto Octavius, under his breath, mutters the word Osborn. As if to say he recognizes both the Green Goblin and knows it's Norman Osborn inside the suit. Now this initially made me curious because I thought they were taking the route of saying these villains are based on the versions from the other movies. But they are in fact from an alternate reality where those movies are not canon because in the Raimi canon, nobody, at least up to the Spider-Man 2 point in the timeline, knew that Norman Osborn was in fact the Green Goblin. That was intentionally kept a very closely guarded secret by Peter Parker in accordance with Norman Osborn's last wish. Otto Octavius, in accordance with Sam Raimi canon, should have no idea who that is under the Green Goblin suit. The fact that he knows him at all led me to believe these villains were taken from a timeline where they are all alive and well and have had dealings with each other in the past. But later on, we find out that Dr. Octopus knows that Osborn died years ago in a fight with Spider-Man, which is essentially saying that this movie has the balls to treat the Raimi films as canon and treat itself as an alternate sequel to them. First off, Fuck you, Marvel, for having the delusion to think that. And secondly, that decision is not only insulting, but it's also going to come back to bite you in the ass. You're treating those movies as canon, but you've already broken the canon by having Octavius recognize Osborn as the Green Goblin. In the canon of the Sam Raimi movies, nobody knows who the Green Goblin is, and that's entirely because of Norman's dying wish to Peter to keep his alter ego and heinous misdeeds a secret from his son Harry. So Peter disposed of the evidence, including Goblin's suit and likely his glider as well, because if anyone finds out, then the media finds out, and if the media finds out, then Harry finds out. In Spider-Man 2, Dr. Octopus sacrifices himself to destroy his own creation in order to protect the city of New York. And it's only after this that Harry Osborn finds Norman Osborn's secret lair where he keeps all of his Green Goblin weaponry as well as the suit and glider. And it's here where Harry realizes who his father actually was. But Otto Octavius should have had no fucking clue that Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin. You know, when Doc Ock recognized Norman Osborn, initially, I was actually kind of excited because I thought that this film was entirely taking the fan fiction route. 
recognizing what it is, that it's not a direct continuation of those movies, that it's a completely new and separate canon, an imitation of those movies rather, and its characters at best. And same goes for the Mark Webb films, so please don't think I'm biased to just the Raimi movies. Having Doc Ock recognize Norman Osborn as the Green Goblin because they are both antagonists to Spider-Man and know each other well because of that, would have been a cool alternate reality to create. And it certainly would have made a lot more sense where all the villains would have been alive and well. But unfortunately, no. John Watts, Sony, Marvel, and Disney decided to take the let's try to be canon route without doing their homework. And that was a mistake. We will get back to the multiverse stuff in a few moments. But back to the freeway, before Goblin can attack Peter and Dr. Octopus, Dr. Strange portals them both to safety. Peter has returned to Sanctum Centura, and Doc Ock has been portaled into some kind of containment cell. And we see that Dr. Strange has captured Dr. Connors, aka the Lizard, from the Mark Webb original Amazing Spider-Man movie. And Lizard is sitting in the cell beside Dr. Octopus. And it's here that Dr. Strange tells both Peter and the audience just what is going on. They briefly opened up space-time, and started getting visitors from, quote, every universe. When I shut that spell down, we started getting some visitors from every universe. Doctor Strange says he needs Peter to send them back. Peter insists for some reason that he wants Ned and Michelle to help him out, and we get the cringy, though somewhat altered scene from the trailer where Doctor Strange utters that stupid Scooby-Doo line. Please, Scooby-Doo this crap. Oh my god, my insides are on fire! And Michelle has to point out to Doctor Strange that this disaster isn't just Peter's fault because it was Doctor Strange who cast the spell. You know, all this is kind of your mess. Once again, making Doctor Strange look like an unnecessary dickhead to Peter, in addition to already making him look stupid when he cast the damn spell in the first place. Doctor Strange does devise a simple but effective plan to deal with the invaders. He enchants Peter's suit with some magic and tells Peter to find the invaders and zap them with the magic he gave him and they'll be transported back to the cells. Simple, easy, effective. I like it. So in Peter's search for the invaders, he swings out towards the wilderness and finds Jamie Foxx's Electro and a battle ensues between the two of them. The fight's going okay, but then it's interrupted by Sandman of all things. And yes, it's the very same Sandman from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man 3. I don't have too much to say about this sequence, except that it's convenient that Sandman found Peter and Electro when he did, unless they both emerged at the same time and place, which is convenient. And the same goes for when Dr. Octopus and Norman Osborn emerge together on the freeway. Sandman decides to help Peter because, similarly to Dr. Octopus, He initially thinks it's the Peter Parker from his universe. Now, I think that makes enough sense, but what I found jarring was how the characters were interacting with each other. Sandman must have come from a point in time where he and Peter had already reconciled at the end of Spider-Man 3, which is fine, but the way Flint Marco calls him Peter so casually by his first name, it's almost as if the two of them are friends, or he's insinuating that they are friends where he's from. Peter, it's me. Flint Marco, you remember? Uh, I- I'll explain everything, but first can you help me stop this guy? Okay. Alright, let's go! Did nobody else find this odd? Like, just because Peter forgave Marco for what he did to Uncle Ben, I don't think that exactly puts them on a first-name basis with each other. Look, it's just a small gripe I had. Nothing to get hung up about. Let's move on. After Peter sends both villains back to Doctor Strange, he gets a call telling him that one of the invaders he is looking for is currently with Aunt May. And it turns out that it's a very frightened and confused Norman Osborn who has found his way there because he wants the help of the Peter Parker from that universe. Peter rushes to Aunt May, fearing the worst, but it turns out that Norman Osborn is relatively harmless after having supposedly ditched his alter ego by destroying the Goblin Mask, as I mentioned before. I understand what they were going for, I get the symbolism, but I still hate that they did it. Personally, I loved Sam Raimi's Green Goblin suit. And the movie was sold on the basis of flaunting nostalgia, but the only shot we get of the Raimi Goblin suit being worn was from the trailers, which in case, fuck you Marvel. But I know what a lot of people are going to say, this is how the Green Goblin is meant to look from the source material, and Willem Dafoe looks so much more like the character with just the bodysuit and the hood. But still, the Sam Raimi Goblin suit was iconic for a reason. Let's not forget. But that's not the only reason why this bothers me. See, the writers seem to be under the impression that Norman Osborn breaking the goblin mask is enough to bring him back to sanity, as if it's that easy. 
But assuming that Norman Osborn was taken from a timeline that takes place in the latter half of Sam Raimi's first Spider-Man movie, I'm pretty sure the Goblin had already pretty much completely taken over Norman Osborn's mind by that point. The board members. You killed them. We killed them. We? Remember your little accident in the laboratory? Me, your greatest creation. Bringing you what you've always wanted. Power beyond your wildest dreams. And it's only the beginning. There's only one who can stop us. Or imagine if he joined us. We can destroy him. I can't. Parker must be educated. What do I do? Instruct him in the matters of loss and pain. Yes. And then grant his wish. Tell me how! The heart, Osborne! And what they do with him in No Way Home is a very simplified look at Norman Osborne's character. To just say he has two personalities like a migraine that comes and goes. When he's meant to constantly be battling with himself. But towards the end of his life, in the climax of the first Spider-Man movie, you could interpret his inner conflict as one of two things. Either he was able to fight off the Goblin's urges, but was still a slave to it. Or he was simply too far gone and they were one and the same by the end of the film. I personally think it was the latter that we were seeing in the climax of that movie where Norman Osborn almost kills Spider-Man and ultimately does kill himself. Norman as the Goblin was feigning helplessness to Peter while the Goblin as Norman pressed the button to get the glider into position to blindside him. Anyway, my point is, while I like how Defoe portrays the Green Goblin in this movie, remaining faithful to his power-hungry and anarchist nature from Spider-Man 1, the way they have Willem Defoe portray Norman Osborn in tangent with the Goblin, I think was something of a misfire on the director's behalf, for not fully understanding what the character was and where he came from. Who said that? Don't play the innocent with me. You've known all along. Again, that's not to say that Defoe doesn't do a good job or that Norman Osborn is unlikable. I'm just saying it feels somewhat off and overly simplified. So anyway, here's something I really wanted to talk about and quite possibly it could be the most important thing I have to discuss for this entire review. I like the multiverse as a concept, don't get me wrong. It allows for a lot of unique possibilities and alternate realities if utilized properly. Let me get this out of the way quickly. If you can't wrap your head around the possibility of a multiverse and other parallel universes existing, then for the love of God, don't watch a movie about the damn multiverse. Because your entire enjoyment of the movie rests on your ability to suspend your disbelief that a completely batshit insane concept is the premise for the movie. When I shut that spell down, we started getting some visitors from every universe. Multiverse is real. Multiverse is a concept about which we know frighteningly little. Let's talk about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse for a second. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of that movie. In fact, I think it's the most overrated Spider-Man movie ever made for a myriad of different reasons, the biggest of which are spoilers. But despite my criticisms of the movie, I didn't decide to watch a movie called Into the Spider-Verse with the intent of hating the multiverse on premise alone because why else would I be watching the fucking movie? Point I'm getting at is I can suspend my disbelief for a multiverse plot if it's done correctly. And most of my criticisms of Into the Spider-Verse aside, that movie did a pretty decent job with its premise of having a multiverse. There's a far less contrived catalyst for its plot, mild spoilers for Into the Spider-Verse ahead, so while I'm saying this, you best click away if you haven't seen the movie and still want to. Okay, you've been warned, let's continue. Spider-Man is accidentally pushed into what's called a super collider. A device that's specifically designed to draw in specific individuals from other universes. When Spider-Man and his DNA are pushed into the Super Collider, this is what draws in all the other Spider-Man entities from parallel points of time and space into the universe where the Collider was being used. So no matter where each Spider-Person was at that point in time, they were dragged into the universe of Miles Morales. The only exception, and it's one of my biggest problems with the movie, is Gwen Stacy is pulled into the universe, but she's also shot back in fucking time for the sake of the plot, and for a surprise reveal later on in the story. Now, let me make this perfectly fucking clear. The multiverse has nothing to do with time travel. 
But aside from that, the way Spider-Verse explores its multiverse concept is actually pretty good. And that movie also does a great job of exploring wacky alternative Spider-Mans. For example, Spider-Pig and Spider-Noir. Spider-Man No Way Home, on the other hand, explores its multiverse concept in the worst possible way. Because not only is this movie pretending like it's canon to the other films, but it's picking and choosing select and ultra super contrived points in time from where it's ripping these individuals from to place into the Marvel Cinematic Universe timeline. Spider-Man was trying to stop my fusion reactor. So I stopped him. I had him by the throat. And then I... And then I was here. And then he caused the overload. I was stuck in the grid, absorbing data. I was about to turn into pure energy. And then, and then, uh, and then, oh shit. I was about to die. Max, do you know, do I die? If Marvel, Sony, and Disney wanted to use the multiverse correctly, they would have brought in a female Dr. Octopus, like Liv from Into the Spider-Verse, for example. They would have brought in Spider-Gwen. Or they could have, I don't know, created their own Sandman, Green Goblin, and Electro. And tossed them into the film. But because they need to slap a bunch of familiar faces onto the big screen to sell and market their movie. In order to mass appeal to fans dying to see their old favourites. They also cherry picked select moments in time that would be just perfect for what their movie's plot needed. That being every single villain was taken out of their universe just before their deaths. I'm talking minutes before they died. Or in the case of Doc Ock and Lizard, right before Spider-Man was able to bring them back to sanity and they ceased being villains. And of course, the one exception to both being Sandman, who never died, but who they snatched out of his universe after the reconciliation with Peter Parker. So he would act as if he and Peter knew each other and were friends when he emerged on screen. Which I previously explained felt very out of place and premature for their friendship, if you could even call it that. To put it in perspective, Doctor Strange said they started getting visitors from, quote, every universe. No, they actually started just getting visitors from only two alternate universes. Technically three, if you count Tom Hardy's Venom, who doesn't even show up until after the credits. But yeah, every universe mainly only constituted two universes, with cherry-picked fan-favorite characters from cherry-picked points in time. And like I said, the multiverse is about parallel universes. It is not about time travel or select points in different timelines. The characters from Spider-Verse were taken from different universes from the same parallel points in time. Which makes sense. No Way Home takes characters from two alternate universes and rips them out of multiple points in time. Which again, is not how the multiverse is meant to be used. It's just Marvel's way of bullshitting fan service onto the screen for fans to empty out their wallets for, cheer at the cinema screens, and clap like seals. Now, just in case I get someone saying, but noms, Penny Parker and Spider-Noir were taken from the future and the past in Into the Spider-Verse. So the multiverse is about jumping through time. No, you're wrong, and let me be clear as to why. I said they were taken from different universes with parallel points in time. Penny Parker came from a universe where technology is far more advanced. And Spider-Noir came from a universe where, in the parallel point of time, had technology that was far more primitive. But both Penny Parker and Spider-Noir came from the same parallel point in time as the other Spider-Man characters were. To sum it up, Miles Morales is living in the year 2018, while Penny Parker's parallel point in time is the year 3145. And Spider-Noir's parallel point in time is 1933. But these characters are not time traveling. Where are we? This is Cohort, Brian. Same year, same time. But in this universe, Christianity never existed. Which means the dark ages of scientific repression never occurred, and thus humanity is a thousand years more advanced. Ergo, muscular, genetically perfect pigs. Hey, look, there's Quagmire. Thanks, honey. Say hi to your husband. Oh, I got AIDS again. You know, speaking of the multiverse, it's sad to see that we live in a universe where Family Guy got the multiverse concept correct, but Disney and Marvel Studios' $200 million budget got it wrong. No Way Home just wanted a terrible fucking excuse to use every fan favorite character from other movies as they could and bullshit them into existence to make more money for the MCU. Not sure why they used Electro though, but 
If I had to guess, that was just off to the star power of Jamie Foxx. The sad thing is, this could have been done and achieved far better if they weren't, once again, trying to abide by the Sam Raimi and Mark Webb canons. They could have made an alternate universe where all of these villains played by the same actors could have been alive and well at the same time and that would have made much more sense but because Kevin Feige and the ego of the MCU is lodged so far up their asses, they thought it was ethical to use other creators canon and unfortunately didn't have the intelligence to do it effectively and consistently. Well, at least for the most part. But the whole multiverse plotline and its reasoning is completely fucked all the way up, doesn't make a lick of sense, and relies on probably the most convenience that I've ever seen required for a plot to function. Another mistake they made with the canon is that these villains were taken from select points in time that the plot needed them to be taken, and for several villains they were ripped out of their universes right before their deaths, and so with that said, I'm expecting Topher Grace's Eddie Brock to show up anytime with a big fat story about how he was about to get blown up, but then woke up in this new and strange universe. Any second now. Wait for it. Come on Topher, everyone's waiting. I mean, after all, this movie's whole multiverse bullshit is meant to take characters out of the Raimi and Mark Webb timelines that is attempting to be consistent with their canons, respectively. It's not like Disney and Sony would exclude you from the film because your portrayal of Venom was poorly received. Oh, I see. <laughs> and that, my friends, that's how you know that this whole multiverse bollocks was just a sad, desperate, and poorly constructed bullshit attempt at an excuse for the sole shameful purpose of making money. Because if it wasn't... Topher Grace's Venom would have been in the end credit scene and not the money printing machine known as Tom Hardy. One last thing, why did the multiverse in this instance only target Spider-Men and their villains? Why wasn't Aunt May taken to another universe while she was knitting? Why wasn't Mr. Dinkovich tossed into another universe while he was on the John? And most unforgivably, we were denied one of, if not all, the many faces of Bruce Campbell tossed into this clusterfuck of a multiverse. Now that was a missed opportunity, but nope. Just Spider-Men and just their villains, not their friends, relatives, or acquaintances. Now, the supposed reason for this is because the writers included a few throwaway lines from Doctor Strange that mentions how only those who know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man are being dragged into their universe from the multiverse. But in the multiverse, there are an infinite number of people who know Peter Parker is Spider-Man. That spell gets loose, they're all coming here. Look, I know, I get it. This is their way of making a loosely and quite frankly sad attempt to justify what they're doing. I understand that the parameters of this are meant to relate back to Doctor Strange's original spell, which I suppose again explains why they stupidly decided not to simply erase Mysterio from everyone's memory instead. But even still, I see this as far more of a cop-out to justify themselves and what they're doing, especially since they're purposefully excluding characters who knew Peter Parker was Spider-Man, and included characters that absolutely did not, to appease fans and maximize star power. But they provide this batshit excuse for what they're doing, and they don't even abide by their own rules. Electro did not know that Peter Parker was Spider-Man. Period. And the movie even points that out, even including an extremely forced Miles Morales tease in the process. You got a nice face, you're just a kid. You from Queens. You got that suit. You help a lot of poor people. I just thought you was going to be black. There's got to be a black Spider-Man somewhere out there. And then there's Venom, who appears in the post credit scene, and the reason he apparently knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man is because in that post credit scene from the Let There Be Carnage Venom sequel, Venom says that the symbiotic race he's a part of is a hive mind that spans multiple universes. 80 billion light years of hive knowledge across universes would explode your tiny little brain. <laughs> what? What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, setting aside the bullshit line that was inserted as some sad attempt to justify Venom's inclusion in No Way Home, if the symbiote hive mind spans universes, and Venom supposedly knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, some fucking how, then why does Tom Hardy need to ask the bartender about the events of the MCU and the events of Infinity War? Because if this supposed hive mind of symbiotes spanned multiple universes like Venom said, then shouldn't Venom absolutely know about this? Why would Eddie Brock need to ask some random at a bar to find out these details? And just one final 
nailing the coffin of this shitty explanation, as previously discussed in depth, this doesn't excuse ripping villains from multiple points in time, because for the billionth time, the multiverse is not about time travel. I probably should have mentioned that Aunt May, when Peter arrived to find her talking to Norman Osborn, she all of a sudden decided to be more than just a MILF joke, and gives Peter a heart-to-heart about him helping Norman and making his problems Peter's problems or some bullshit. I wonder where or where they are taking her on this journey. We shall come back to that very soon. But after Peter has a moment to talk to the villains, he realizes that they all die fighting Spider-Man. Or, sorry, rather that most of them die fighting Spider-Man. The whole purpose of this conversation between the villains, aside from the obvious fan service on display, You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. is to spark a very contrived motivation for Peter to not want to send these villains back to their respective universes because he doesn't want to send them to their supposed inevitable deaths. More on that in a second. But hilariously, it's Sandman, one of the Raimi Spider-Man villains, that not only doesn't die in his universe, which tosses a gigantic hole along with Lizard in these we-need-to-save-the-villains plotline bullshit, but it's also Sandman who expositions Peter Parker and the audience about the very specific circumstances surrounding both the deaths of Green Goblin and Doc Ock, saying how it was all over the news, where not only was this information not in the media, but secondly, and most hilariously, Sandman was in prison at the time and very likely wouldn't have had any idea what was happening in New York when all of this was going down. Yeah, just another reason why trying desperately to abide by the canon of the other Spider-Man movies and universes was a colossal mistake for this movie because these writers didn't do their fucking homework. Or they were just so desperate to have this fan service included in the movie that they just didn't give a fuck. They both died, fighting Spider-Man. It was all over the news. Green Goblin, impaled by the glider you flew around on. And a couple of years later... You, Doc Ock, drown in the river with your machine. (laughs) That's nonsense. But basically, the gist of this is that Peter feels sorry for them. And because of this tiny little chat he had with Aunt May, he now wants to help fix these villains because for some reason, he's certain that they're all going to die. And for some reason, he cares. Peter was ready to send them back not 20 minutes ago, but now is having a crisis of conscience for helping these villains that don't even belong in his universe and who he's only just met and has no attachment to whatsoever. Not only that, but let's get something straight here. The very knowledge these villains now have that they will die by Spider-Man's hand, supposedly, should be enough for them to change the outcome. Here's an idea, just don't be morons and don't fight Spider-Man and then they don't die. In fact, that's a surefire way to absolutely make certain that they do not die. But Peter all of a sudden wants to prevent them from going back because plot. This paper-thin plot is about to be padded the fuck out big time. Doctor Strange is actually doing the sensible thing by having figured out a way to reverse the spell and send these villains home. A perfectly sensible and logical plan. It's nice to see Doctor Strange back on track for about, well, five seconds because of what's about to happen next. Peter argues with Doctor Strange about the moral dilemma of sending them back knowing their fate, but Doctor Strange is undeterred and he gets ready to push the button that will send these villains home and reverse the spell he originally cast. Which, by By the way, I've got to mention how all of the MCU Spider-Man movies up to this point have had terrible titles. Spider-Man Homecoming was a weird title considering how that the Homecoming dance barely had anything to do with that movie's plot. And Spider-Man Far From Home was a title that was incredibly meh. But at least it made some sense considering the fact that in that film, Spider-Man leaves New York and travels the world. However, Spider-Man No Way Home is not just meh and pathetic as far as titles go. But it also, in addition to that, makes no fucking sense whatsoever. No way home? All Doctor Strange has to do is push a goddamn button and off they go. The title for this movie is just fucking stupid. And you know what I absolutely cannot stand? Is this movie bafflingly tries to portray Doctor Strange as the bad guy in this situation. When he's just trying to do his job and is actually thinking about the greater good, like any normal person would. Peter even decides to morally grandstand and insinuate that Doctor Strange is a heartless prick, 
when everybody, including Peter Parker, should know that's absolutely not true when it comes to Doctor Strange. Strange. We can't send them back. Not yet. Why? Oh, some of these guys are gonna die. Parker, it's their fate. Come on, Strange, have a heart. Go fuck yourself, buddy. If Doctor Strange didn't have a heart, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have risked tampering with space-time to solve your college crisis because you were too dumb, selfish, or lazy to solve this problem yourself. Also, having been a previous keeper of the Infinity Time Stone, shouldn't Doctor Strange know there are literally millions of potential alternate outcomes? Over 14 million futures, in fact? So why exactly doesn't he use this argument against Peter when he's worried about sending the villains to their deaths? When Doctor Strange says, Parker, it's their fate. That's just the writers sabotaging his character even more because he should absolutely know better. There are so many possible alternative outcomes, as, like I said, the fact that these villains know that Spider-Man is directly related to their supposed demise should be enough for them to change the outcome on their own, in fact. But unfortunately, Doctor Strange isn't allowed to be Doctor Strange. And he doesn't tell Peter this because we have to pad out this plot. And rather than just have a civilized conversation with each other, the movie decides to speed so far ahead that it skips to Peter Parker straight up defying Doctor Strange by force, which results in the two of them having a battle for the MacGuffin that will let them reverse the spell. Strange, stop! Can we please just talk about this? Don't. And this fight was complete and utter horseshit. There's one tiny bit that I like, which is where Doctor Strange easily overpowers Peter Parker and pushes his spirit out of his physical body. And then while Peter is in control of his own body, Doctor Strange briefly fails to grab the box from Peter's hand because Peter's body is reacting on its own due to spider sense. Now that was funny and it was consistent, but the fight doesn't end there. And Doctor Strange absolutely should have won this fight, but instead he forgets to restrain Peter's body so he can take the McGuffin and Peter just swims back through the air into his own body and the fight drags out. Peter's plot armor in fact makes Doctor Strange desperate enough to open up a mirror dimension of his own making where he has the advantage so that he can turn the tables on Peter. After finally getting the MacGuffin back and I hate this part so fucking much Peter Parker decides he's the smartest motherfucker in the universe making Tony Stark's intelligence look like a joke by comparison and he says oh this mirror dimension is just geometry that's all it is just geometry and he does like a billion calculations in his head and starts webbing all over the fucking place and just as Doctor Strange is about to escape he's strung up and neutralized by Peter's web and Peter just abandons him in the mirror dimension having just won a full on fight with Doc fucking strange. God fucking damn it! You have got to be fucking shitting me, movie. Peter Parker got schooled by Dr. Octopus in his Iron Spider suit. But when it comes to Dr. Strange, an entity so powerful he could take on Thanos with a mostly completed Infinity Gauntlet and put up a decent fight, I might add. But you have Dr. Strange lose to Peter Parker in his own dimension without Peter's iron spider suit? Go fuck yourselves. Doctor Strange was fucking butchered in this movie. Look how they mask with my boy. He was made to look stupid, then he was made to look like an asshole, and then he was made to look weak as piss. Poor Doctor Strange. Honestly, he deserved so much better, and not only was this orchestrated to bullshit the plot to continue, but it was also done to remove Doctor Strange from the film until the final battle, because Lord knows the movie would end much sooner if he was allowed to, you know, be Doctor Strange, but anyway. So Peter Parker decides, instead of sending the villains back to their respective universes, to instead try to cure the villains by using Tony Stark's Fabricator, the machine that can make anything the user is smart enough to design. To do this, they need to go to Happy apartment but Peter tells Michelle to go with Ned and he gives her Doctor Strange's MacGuffin. Michelle tells him if she does not hear from him she's going to push the button and she goes with Ned to his grandmother's house. Meanwhile at Happy's apartment Peter is working with Norman Osborn to design a new inhibitor chip for Doctor Octopus and other antidotes for Sandman and Electro and Lizard and of course, Green Goblin. Okay, this is stupid for several reasons. First of all, all this takes place in like a couple of hours, which is absurd. And secondly, 
Once again, Peter is the smartest guy on planet fucking Earth and is able to instantly design tech far beyond what he knows to cure villains he should have no idea how to cure. Villains he just met, by the way. Some of which who are completely fucked all the way up. So let's be clear, I've never been a big fan of the fabricator device in the first place. I think it's a BS get out of jail free card for whenever the characters need something, or in this case, just a bullshit plot convenience. Though I can't blame No Way Home for the fabricator existing, that dishonor goes to Spider-Man Far From Home. However, at least in that movie, all they have Peter do is just make himself another Spider-Man suit, which is a piece of tech he is very well acquainted with. But Norman Osborn's performance enhances Doc Ock's inhibitor chip, Electro's electrical problem, Sandman's sand problem, and Lizard's mutation, Tom Holland's Peter Parker doesn't have the first fucking clue about. Anyway, Peter makes Doc Ock a new inhibitor chip that cures him of his tentacle problem, and finally he has control of his own body and free will again. And honestly, again, I just hate this so much because it shows me these writers and this studio completely missed the point of Spider-Man 2. Because in that movie, Otto Octavius doesn't need technology to regain control. It's due to Peter's compassion and reasoning that Doc Ock, through sheer determination, intelligence, and straight-up willpower, he was able to regain control of his own body and mind and save himself. You once spoke to me about intelligence, that it was a gift to be used for the good of mankind. Trying to do better. You know, being brilliant is not enough, young man. You have to work hard. Intelligence is not a privilege, it's a gift. And you use it for the good of mankind. These things have turned you into something you're not. Don't listen to them. It was my dream. Sometimes, to do what's right, we have to be steady. And give up the thing we want the most. Even our dreams. Listen. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. <laughs> that was earned. This is not. Which can basically sum up MCU Phase 4 in a nutshell. The lack of earning anything. And this movie actively tries to retcon Dr. Octopus's fantastic arc in Spider-Man 2 through a whole bunch of MCU bullshit of taking the easy way out. Now apparently, and I have to address this, and this is just what I've been told, it's apparently not meant to be a retcon because there's this variant bullshit that the Loki series introduced where anyone who goes from one universe to another and then gets sent back to their own universe will have created a variant timeline or some shit. I haven't seen Loki, but that whole show and its multiverse stuff sounds so batshit that I don't even want to go near it. And if nothing else, that's just a cop-out so these filmmakers can say, no, it's not intended to be a retcon or anything, when it absolutely is, or at least that's what it's insinuating. Let's rescue these alternate reality villains the MCU way with crappy humor, instant technology, BS, and absolutely nothing earned. But again, let's be real, this movie is dream dreaming if it thinks it's anything close to canon to those other movies. Anyway, predictably, before Peter is finished curing the other villains, Norman Osborn's Green Goblin alter ego takes him over once again and he starts to manipulate the other villains into revolting against what Peter is doing, which causes a massive fight to break out and Electro to turn against Doc Ock and Sandman who flees. One thing I'll repeat here is that I think they nailed the persona of Sam Raimi's vision for Green Goblin. Like I said, he's still the power-hungry anarchist who's trying to manipulate others and prey on their weaknesses. And in this case, it was Electro who didn't want to go back to being nothing. Because before he was Electro, he was essentially invisible. Nobody noticed him and nobody wanted to. The fear of losing that is what causes him to revolt, and that's absolutely fine. But once again, here's another problem I actually do have with Green Goblin. And that's how they gave the character a ginormous buff in strength. And not to mention, he can take one hell of an ass kicking and still be okay. Look, I'm not usually one to nitpick this bullshit. I understand that this is a movie at the end of the day. I'm just saying, I thought Green Goblin was way stronger than he should have been in this movie. And despite Peter having just beaten Doctor Strange, Green Goblin beats Peter Parker soundly, I might add, which I also find incredibly hard to believe, especially with all of Peter's Stark tech embedded in his suit. Does nobody else find that odd? Anyway, Green Goblin holds Peter at his mercy, and Aunt May, after fleeing to the bottom of the building, finds 
finds Peter and insists on not leaving him, and then Norman forces Peter to watch as his glider almost impales Aunt May when it blasts into the room, and then Norman leaves after throwing a pumpkin bomb at both of them which Peter fails to stop. This explosive almost kills Peter and Aunt May appears to be fine as she calls out to him, but it's very evident by the way her voice keeps cracking that something is very very wrong. Peter tells her that this was a mistake and that he quote can't save everyone, and then for the love of all that is holy, and after over half a decade of criticism levied at the MCU for not acknowledging Uncle Ben, the most important character in Peter's development as a hero, Kevin Feige, this colossal dickhead, and the rest of the team at Marvel Studios decide to give Uncle Ben's iconic moment with Peter Parker to Aunt Milf fucking May. And she even says the line, with great power comes great responsibility. You have a gift. You have power. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Fuck you film. Seriously, just fuck yourself. This isn't a harmless reference, mind you, or a clever play on words. This is actively spitting in the face of arguably the most beloved character in Spider-Man lore. And what's even worse is that the MCU is even spitting on itself at this point because it actively retcons two important moments with Peter's character in both Captain America Civil War and Spider-Man Homecoming. Look, when you can do the things that I can, but you don't, And then the bad things happen. They happen because of you. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. But your father lived by a philosophy, a principle really, that if you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. Not choice, responsibility. You can't tell anybody about this. You gotta keep it a secret. Well, secret why? I don't know what she's like. If she finds out people try and kill me every single night, she's not gonna let me do this anymore. I don't think I can keep this a secret. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, Peter. May cannot know. I cannot do that to her right now. You know? I mean, everything that's happened with her, I... Please. Okay. Just swear it, okay? You have a gift. You have power. And with great power, there must also come great responsibility. For those of you who probably think I'm a massive MCU Spider-Man hater at this point, I'm going to tell you right now... I'm really not. In fact, I was initially one of the far more forgiving fans regarding Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Did I care that Peter Parker in the context of the MCU was essentially Iron Boy Jr.? Absolutely fucking not. And why was that? Well, there were several reasons, but one of the main reasons I didn't mind the exclusion of Uncle Ben is because this was the third iteration of Spider-Man in just over a decade, and both the Sam Raimi and Mark Webb movies had made films going through Peter's backstory in its entirety, so I understood and even commended the MCU for not wanting to retread the same ground by producing yet another Spider-Man origin story when they decided to introduce their own iteration of the character. Instead, deciding to have the character already established and bringing him in with Tony Stark while insinuating the Uncle Ben storyline did in fact happen but off screen. Everyone knew what and who Peter was referring to in Captain America Civil War and Spider-Man Homecoming. Unless you were hiding under a rock because the with great power comes great responsibility line is one of the most recognizable and iconic lines in fiction. And that moment from Spider-Man 1 was being memed and echoed all over the fucking place before memes or even a thing on the internet. But in Spider-Man No Way Home, all of this is disregarded, just so the writers can be like, see, see, we did the thing, we did, see, we finally made the MILF May a character. Yes, you finally made her a character after three movies, congratulations, and no, all you did, and the best you could do, was just turn her into another character. Because A, at this point, I struggle to believe you dumb fuck writers have any idea who Aunt May is, and who the character is supposed to be, and B, you simply don't know how to write good characters on your own. And for those of you who doubt me, John Watts is the guy who forgot Spider-Sense existed when he was tasked to make Spider-Man Homecoming, and Marissa Tomei, bless her heart, wasn't even told how old Aunt May was supposed to be until after she accepted the part. Which tells me these people had no intention of doing justice to Aunt May and only decided to make her more than a MILF joke after being criticized for it. And they decide to miss two birds with one stone by just turning her into Uncle Ben. Just fucking 
awful. The only thing that saves Aunt May's death scene is Tom Holland's exceptional acting. He is such a talented and well cast choice for Peter Parker. And they keep cutting off the potential for his films at the kneecaps by overshadowing him in his own movies with other characters and cameos. Understand, of course, Spider-Man is arguably the most popular Marvel character and will likely always be a big draw. But Tom Holland, unfortunately, wasn't the draw for Homecoming. Spider-Man was the draw, and he was paired together with Tony Stark who is the most popular character in the MCU. Thankfully, Tom Holland was the star of Far From Home, but unfortunately, that movie was overshadowed by the events of Avengers Endgame, which is why most people were so eager to watch it, aside from the fact that it was a Spider-Man film, and despite the fact that Far From Home's plot and characters were incredibly meh. And in this film, Tom Holland is the least interesting and memorable part of his own movie, which is actually sad. It's a damn tragedy, and I really think Tom Holland and deserved better and Kevin Feige should have trusted him to carry a movie on his own without the assistance of other MCU cameos and plot points. Anyway, Happy Hogan shows up like a true homie and causes a distraction that allows Peter to escape the police. Then we go back to Michelle and Ned who are hiding out with the box containing Doctor Strange's spell and the button that can end the movie anytime they wish. Before I continue, I just wanted to point out one last middle finger this movie gives to Doctor Strange. Remember how I said Peter took his magic ring? Well, Peter gave it to Ned and instantly Ned is able to cast magic portals like it's easy as one, two, three. What's worse is that not only does Ned cast the magic with ease, but he also does so by accident. So what took Doctor Strange enormous hard work and dedication to master has now been reduced to a joke because this fat fuck can use it like it's nothing. Okay, so what? This movie is done shitting on Doctor Strange's character and now it's just shitting on his accomplishments, right? That's where we're at? John Watts even added in a throwaway line about how there's, quote, magic in Ned's family or some bullshit. As if that excuses any of this, and I've seen some Marvel stands actually buy it as some legitimate excuse. But then again, that minority deludes themselves into believing anything that will fan fiction the tattered remains of their precious MCU back together. They can't be bargained with, and they can't be reasoned with. Anyway, while Ned is wearing Doctor Strange's ring, he starts aimlessly spouting off remarks about how he wishes Peter was there because he wants to know if his friend is okay. Accidentally opens up one of Doctor Strange's portals to an individual walking down an alleyway. And in a Spider-Man suit, no less. They have found Peter Parker, but it's not who they think it is. And much to the film's credit, this is shot in a way that informs the audience what is happening, while simultaneously building up a hyped reaction and shock, because out of the shadows and jumping through the portal is none other than Mark Webb's amazing Spider-Man, played by Andrew fucking Garfield himself. The amazing Spider-Man! Seriously, the reaction to seeing him again, it just built and built and finally peaked when he took off his mask. I shouldn't have to tell you, especially those of you who were there in the theaters, but for those of you who weren't, I'll happily show you. It's funny because Ned and Michelle are rightfully skeptical of who he is at first and there's a funny sequence that plays out where he tries to prove he's the real Peter Parker, just not from their universe. And once Ned and Michelle understand what's happened, Ned realizes that all he has to do is keep opening portals to Peter Parker's until he finds the one from their universe. And so he opens up another one and who should step through the portal than the GOAT himself, OG Toby fucking Maguire. I'll take care of the music. Yeah, I teed you guys up for that one, didn't I? Look, everyone knew they were showing up in this film. It's the worst kept secret 
ever. But that didn't stop us all from losing our fucking minds to see these beloved individuals again. And in a Spider-Man movie, no less. Honestly, I was terrified during my viewing experience for how these two beloved characters and actors were going to be used in this film. Would they be treated as well as Johnny Lawrence from Cobra Kai? Or would they be as ill-treated as Luke Skywalker, or rather, Jake Skywalker from The Last Jedi? Words cannot describe how happy I was to see that these beloved character imitations of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man and Mark Webb's Amazing Spider-Man, as well as their actors, were treated like the former and not the latter. The response to this film has been overwhelmingly positive, and it's largely because the characters that the majority of the audience cherished so much were actually treated with respect. Well, mostly with respect. But from the moment Andrew Garfield jumped through that portal... This dumpster fire of a movie actually started to breathe some fucking life. Still got the moves. Every moment, every second that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are on screen with any of the other characters, especially Tom Holland's Spider-Man, the movie gets a shot of charisma right to the loins and sprouts a raging fucking hard on. The Spider-Men absolutely steal the fucking show. Do they save the movie? Eh, uh, well, as the Spider-Man saying goes, you can't save everyone. But, that's not to say they do a damn good job in trying. The chemistry between the actors Toby, Andrew, and Tom is fantastic and better than anyone, myself included, thought it would be. And honestly, aside from the shameless act of stealing creative assets from other creators' movies, I don't have much of an issue with how Andrew and Toby are integrated using the multiverse. They weren't taken from a contrived point in time that's required for the plot to work. They were taken from their respective universes from a parallel point in time, as I described with Into the Spider-Verse. It's as if their timelines continued after their movies and they're still doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're still being Spider-Man. I will always be Spider-Man. I knew you'd come back. Yeah, thanks for stepping up for me. You're the bravest kid I've ever seen. I'm gonna take care of this trick. You go take care of your mom, okay? Alright, get out of here, go. Ah, there's no place like home. And each of them have come a long way. Except now, each of them, and particularly Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, have gained so much more wisdom from continuing their journeys off screen, and as the audience would have expected them to. And like I said, this movie will never be legitimate canon to those movies. That's just how it works. Let's get real. But that said, I do need to commend the film for, dare I say it, making it feel like these characters are in a sequel to their respective movies. After some banter and friendly camaraderie is exchanged between Tobey and Andrew, we discover that they've been in the MCU timeline for over a day at this point, and each has already realized what exactly is going on. They are in the universe of another Peter Parker, and they've been searching for him. And they're very anxious to do so because Toby and Andrew can sense that he's in some kind of trouble. So they all go to try and track down Tom Holland's Peter Parker, finding him in the one place where he goes to find sanctuary from all of his life's problems. And that's the rooftop of his high school. And this was set up earlier in the movie, where Peter and Michelle retreated to the rooftop to escape the constant paparazzi and curious students who wonder if Peter actually killed Mysterio and wouldn't leave him alone. And all of which who wouldn't stop staring at him because they finally know that he is, and always has been, Spider-Man. Take a second to imagine what kind of personal hell that would be for Peter. Everyone knows who you are, everybody stares at you, and half of those people, meaning half of everybody, thinks he killed someone in cold blood. And after the loss of Aunt May, Peter has withdrawn to the same place. He's clearly hell-bent on getting revenge on the Green Goblin, but then Toby and Andrew approach to try and reason with him. Two alternate, older and wiser Peter Parkers who understand exactly how he feels. Each of them shares the relatable tragedy from their backstories and the burden of guilt each of them carries with them. For Toby, it was his Uncle Ben, and for Andrew, most recently, it was Gwen Stacy. They try to assure Tom Holland's Spider-Man that he's not alone, and what he's feeling is normal, but he can't take revenge by killing. Quite frankly, it was a beautiful scene to behold, and I once again commend the filmmakers on a great job. The only issue I really had was, again, using the with great power comes great responsibility from Aunt May's death as the connective tissue for the other Spider-Man to relate their stories to the MCU Spider-Man. But that aside, and skipping ahead, all three Spider-Men work together to find the cures for each of their respective villains, and once again, especially now, without the Fabricator, I refuse to believe 
The Peter Parkers can just concoct cures for each respective villain's ginormous fucking problems over the course of a few hours in one fucking evening using the materials inside a high school science laboratory. They aren't cooking crystal meth here. They are curing shit that requires the highest level of scientific equipment and likely weeks and months of research. So this is even more plot BS. And once again, I really hate the let's cure these villains plotline instead of just sending them the fuck back home by pushing the button. But that said, and just taking the good with the bad here, the camaraderie between the Spider-Man is awesome to behold. There's a lot of awesome moments. Some of it's actually clever humor, and some of it was just no-brainer stuff that had to be ticked off. Here's your web cartridges. Oh, thanks, man. What's that for? Uh, it's my web fluid. It's for my web shooters. Why? Whoa! You can't do that, huh? No. How on earth does that even... Anyway, we're getting sidetracked. Look Ah, finally. I'm so happy that was addressed, and it was just as wonderful as I had envisioned it. Come on, it's not like we all didn't wonder how that moment would play out. Skipping ahead again, and this time to the climax of the film, which takes place on the Statue of Liberty, which is currently being modified with a Captain America shield. But strangely, there's no Tony Stark arc reactor. Oh, if only Tony was still alive. He would be so pissed that Steve got a monument built to the sky for him, but he wasn't included. Monument built to the sky? with his name plastered. Son of a bitch. Anyway, Tom Holland's Peter Parker lures the villains there by sending a message to the Daily Bugle that broadcasts it to the world. Ned and Michelle are there in case they need to push the button, and Ned is going to try and help by opening and closing portals, but predictably, he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Prior to the battle starting, there's more funny banter between the Spider-Men, and even a funny callback scene to Peter's damaged back from Spider-Man 2. <coughs> You okay? Oh, my back. It's kind of... <laughs> my back! Oh, my back! Yeah, from all the swinging, I guess. Oh, yeah, no, I got a middle back thing, too. Really? Yeah. So, yeah that's good. Wow. Once the fighting begins, the three Spider-Men don't fare so well because they lack teamwork skills. One line that really bothered me is when Toby says he's never worked in a team before. We're clearly not very good at this! I know, I know, we suck! I, I, I don't know how to work as a team! <laughs> me neither. Which, motherfucker, you and Harry teaming up was not only excellent teamwork in Spider-Man 3, but you guys predated the Avengers. And speaking of the Avengers, we get this little gem. I was in the Avengers. The Avengers? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. What is that? Anyway, one other part that really annoyed me, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but when Tom Holland's Peter Parker gave the other Peters a numerical labeling, these fucking film writers had the nerve to label Tom Holland's Spider-Man as Spider-Man 1, as if theirs is the true Spider-Man. Okay, Peter 1, Peter 2, Peter 2, Peter 3. Peter three. All right, let's do this. Let's you delusional retards. Much as I love Tom Holland's Spider-Man, it's common fucking sense that Toby is Spider-Man 1, Garfield is Spider-Man 2, and Tom Holland, the youngest and most inexperienced of the three, is Spider-Man 3. I know, but I thought you were Peter 2. What? I, I'm I, not Peter 2. Stop arguing both of you. Listen to Peter 1. Anyway, the fight progresses much better for them, and the tide begins to turn when they kill Lizard and Sandman, and when it looks like Electro might actually thwart their plan, we get a surprise return, but admittedly predictable, and welcome, I might add, face turn, from the now completely sane Dr. Octopus. And after Electro is cured, Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and Alfred Molina's Doc Ock have a very wholesome moment on screen, where the Doc Ock from Peter's past is acknowledging the man Peter has grown into. Peter? Otto, well, it's good to see you, dear boy. It's good to see you. You're all grown up. <laughs> How are you? Trying to do better. Very satisfying for the fans of the older movies, and completely appropriate given the circumstances. 
Once again, well done. All of a sudden, Doctor Strange returns, and despite the progress the Spider-Men have made in changing the villains' fates, he still wants to push the button to send them all back. But before he can, Green Goblin shows up and pumpkin bombs the MacGuffin, releasing Doctor Strange's malfunctioning spell which begins to rip apart space-time and open up the multiverse. Tom Holland's Peter Parker manages to ground the Green Goblin, and a brutal hand-to-hand fistfight ensues that results in Peter beating the absolute shit out of Green Goblin, almost killing him in fact, and then Peter wants to deliver the final blow by by impaling Goblin with his own glider the way he killed Aunt May, only to be stopped by Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker at the last possible moment. This sequence plays out with no dialogue between the characters, and I think that was a great choice. Both are very talented actors, and everything the audience needed to know about what each of their intentions were and what the characters were saying to each other, without having to say anything, played out perfectly. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man is stopping a younger, more naive version of himself from making the same mistake that he nearly made all those years ago. Having prevented the killing blow, Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker is then stabbed by the Green Goblin, and then Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man tosses Tom Holland's Spider-Man the cure to Goblin's insanity, and he stabs Norman in the neck with it, bringing the fight to a close. Funny story about this actually, mere seconds before I was about to walk into the theatre for this movie, I was stupid enough to open up my Discord and check a DM notification sent to me by one of my fans, and here's what it said. Dude, I just saw a spoiler for Spider-Man No Way Home. Tom Holland's Spider-Man tries to stab Green Goblin, but Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man stops him. Then Toby gets stabbed, and then Tom Holland stabs Willem Dafoe in the neck anyway, what the fuck? Now, reading that spoiler out of context sounds so wrong, and so unbelievably stupid and insulting on so many levels. Can you all imagine the terror running through me walking into the theater after reading that? But thankfully, in context, it actually makes sense. Which is weird, considering how much of this movie does not make sense. But Peter wanting to kill Goblin because he killed Aunt May makes sense. Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker stopping Tom Holland's Peter Parker at the last moment for obvious reasons makes sense. Goblin stabbing Peter makes sense because, well, he's Goblin. And Tom Holland's Peter Parker stabs Green Goblin because he was curing Green Goblin, not killing him. Which thankfully made sense. And Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man doesn't die. Thank God. I'm sure Ryan Johnson cried into his pillow that night. Anyway, Tom Holland's Peter Parker comes up with one last ditch effort to avoid the collapse of the multiverse. He asks Doctor Strange if he were to cast the spell again, but to have everyone forget who Peter Parker is, would that cancel out the first spell? And Doctor Strange tells him yes, but assures him the repercussions would be extreme. Nobody will remember Peter, not his friends, not the Avengers, and not even Doctor Strange himself. It would be as if Peter Parker never existed. With a heavy heart, Tom Holland's Peter Parker agrees to this, deciding to take the responsibility on his shoulders since this whole mess started because of him. Well, him and Doctor Strange being a moron, but shh, there's actual character development happening here, guys. Shh. Peter then bids a heartfelt goodbye to Ned and Michelle and assures her that he will find her and make her remember him. Peter also bids farewell to the other two Spider-Men who assure him he will never truly be alone and to keep them in his heart. So he remembers that. Seconds later, Doctor Strange casts the spell and the crisis is averted. Now, I'm probably missing something logistically wrong with this, but what actually plays out is a bittersweet and admittedly beautiful ending. And it's one of the very few sequences I actually loved in this movie. Peter is now forced to rely on himself. He's essentially cut his ties to the Avengers and to Happy Hogan, which is a shame that they've lost the memory of him, but what's important is that Peter remembers and he takes those life lessons and life experiences he had with the Avengers on board going forward in his own life. Peter desperately rushes off to find Michelle at the cafe where she works and wants to tell her everything he can to make her remember him. But he can't bring himself to do it. He sees that Michelle has the chance to live a normal life without him and that she has a bright future ahead of her that he would only ruin if he decided to once again be selfish. So in the ultimate act of selflessness... He opts to walk away from the woman he loves in order to keep her safe. These acts of selflessness, this burden to deprive oneself of personal happiness because of the responsibility one's power has to the greater good of other people, is what defines Spider-Man as a character. All I wanted was to tell her how much I loved her. I will always be your friend. Only a friend? Peter Parker? That's all I have to give. And 
that's why I think this ending was fantastic for the most part and honestly bold for an MCU movie. I haven't seen an ending this bleak and daring and shocking since Infinity War. Now with that said, Marvel has a well documented history of immediately backtracking on their bold decisions because they're such money grubbing pussies. Let's hope they don't with this one. Peter finds himself a one bedroom studio apartment in the middle of New York because that's all he can afford. He makes himself a new Spider-Man suit using a dinky old sewing machine. There's just one problem with this though. Spider-Man's new suit makes absolutely no sense because he should still have the suit that he built from Tony Stark's fabricator. You know, with all the technological enhancements as well as the nanotech iron spider suit, even though I'd imagine it would be quite damaged at this point. The homemade suit just felt like another box that had to be ticked. In this case, for the OG Spider-Man fans who resented the Iron Boy Jr. gimmick, I'm not saying I don't appreciate what they were trying to do. I'm just saying it's pretty nonsensical because Peter wouldn't willingly disadvantage both himself and other people by using lesser Spider-Man tech. And that was Spider-Man No Way Home. A horrible, horrible disaster of a movie, but a lovable disaster with a very few bright spots peppered throughout. I can personally understand why most people really loved this movie and really enjoyed their cinema experience. But you can't in good conscience tell me it's a well-written movie. It's not even close, in fact. The sad fact of the matter is, these filmmakers and these studios want to splatter nostalgia bait all over the screen, with caution thrown to the fucking wind, and in this case, ruining Doctor Strange in the process, and completely misusing and exploiting the multiverse concept to suit their financial needs, and having some of the most contrived reasoning to both initiate the plot and pat it the fuck out. All because they wanted your money and they wanted lots of it. And based on how this movie was received, you can expect the MCU to repeat this trend over and over and over, because the way it's declining, it's hanging on by a thread at this point, and they know it, and rather than keep scraping from the bottom of the barrel and tossing shit at the wall and hoping something will stick, I fully expect them to ejaculate the X-Men on screen with all of your old favorite cast members and toss a whole butt-fucking-bunch of money at Hugh Jackman to reprise his role as Wolverine because that's a much easier and shameless way to make money. Because writing, as the recent history of the MCU shows, is not their priority. Making money by any shameless means necessary absolutely is. That said, it was wonderful to see our old favourites return. Alfred Molina and Willem Dafoe knocked it out of the park, despite Norman Osborn being overly simplified and Doc Ock at times being turned into a bit of a sideshow. And Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire, as well as Tom Holland, were absolutely incredible. And even though the movie itself was, quite frankly, terrible, I hope the positive reception to the parts that were exceptionally well done will convince Sony to give fans their true fondest wish, and finish what they started long ago. Just be sure not to ruin it again, Sony, by fucking with your own product, you meddlesome pieces of shit. There's more I could probably talk about regarding Spider-Man No Way Home and its plot, including a few nitpicks such as why didn't Doctor Strange use those magic runes to make Thanos forget about his plan for wiping out half the universe? Or the fact that despite the ending, Peter Parker could still very easily just rock up to the Avengers HQ as Spider-Man and likely rejoin the Avengers as if he's a new recruit, giving him access once again to all of their tech and resources, which basically would undo most of what the ending of Spider-Man No Way Home tried to do, which is bring Spider-Man back down to Earth and prevent him from constantly having his hand held, which is probably one of the biggest criticisms Spider-Man and the MCU has received. The ending was done to right that wrong, but it could so easily be undone. But anyway, that aside... But I think it's time to wrap up this video. Boy, how the time did not fly. But thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to leave a like and maybe share the video around. I'd really appreciate it. Just quickly, I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members for their contributions to the channel. If you'd like to support the channel, the Patreon link is in the description, or you could just hit the join button. Feel free to check out the channel's Discord server if you want to chat to the community about Marvel and other things as well. And feel free to check out the rest of my channel and my secondary channels as well. A big shout out and thank you to a British Potato for helping me with the audio editing for this very long video. I've linked his channel below, feel free to check him out, he makes great stuff. And finally, here's one last thank you for staying till the end of the video. You are a legend and I'll see you next time.